A sampling procedure is the set of steps that we take in order to ensure that our sample is of good quality. Sampling errors can be reduced with proper planning before taking a sample. We're going to go over uh, a six-step procedure for sampling. First of all, in step one, we need to conceptually define the target population or target area. So in this case, the target population is the complete set of individuals from which information is to be collected. If we are conducting a geographic sample, then we will have a target area. And here, the entire region or set of locations from which uh, information is to be collected is considered to be the target area. The second step is, define, is to define an operational sampling frame. The sampling frame is a practical or operational structure that contains the entire set of elements from which the sample will be actually drawn. So, for example, if we were trying to draw a sample from the residents of Salt Lake City, we could go to City Hall and ask for a roster of all registered residents. This can sometimes be a major source of sampling bias when the sampling frame somehow represents the population of interest. If we're interested in the inhabitants of Salt Lake City, but rely on a sampling frame that registers only those registered residents with actual addresses, then we're going to miss the homeless population who are inhabitants of the city, but aren't appearing on the sampling frame. Based on what does appear in the sampling frame, we, we can define the sampled population. And this is just the set of individuals or locations, if we're doing a spatial survey, that are in the sampling frame. Hopefully, those individuals in the sampling frame fully correspond with the set of individuals that are in the population. Once we have a sampling frame, we need to select a sampling design. Here we are trying to decide how to choose individuals or locations from the sampling frame and enter them into our sample. We're going to differentiate between sampling designs that are based on probability and those that are called non-probability sampling. Sometimes this is referred to as random sampling and non-random sampling. So with non-probability sampling, the researcher uses judgment or some sort of subjective reasoning to select individuals into the sample. This is often the case when finding uh, participants for small samples, like focus groups or in-depth interviews. And they usually rely on factors such as convenience or how the sample is to be, or how the survey is to be delivered. And uh, on the next slide, we'll see further examples of why we would do non-probability sampling. For probability sampling, each individual in the sampling frame has some sort of probability of being selected into the sample. And then sampling is completed with a random process. This is in line with the scientific method because technically speaking, inferential statistics require the use of some sort of probability sampling. In this figure, we can see examples of both random and non-random sampling procedures. We're going to be dealing mostly with random sampling procedures in this class because these are required by inferential statistics. Step four is to, is, is to design the research instrument and the operational plan. So measurement instruments are the methods and tools used to collect the data. These include direct observation, field measurements, mail surveys, personal interviews, telephone interviews, or web surveys. Different measurement instruments have different sources of errors. For example, if we think about coverage bias, we've already said that certain types of technology, certain uses of technology, for example, in web surveys, would systematically exclude those households without internet connections from your survey. We have to be aware of the different types of biases or errors that would arise uh, based on decisions that we make regarding our measurement instruments. Step five is to conduct a pretest and correct any errors. So a pretest is a trial run or pilot survey used to reveal problems with the survey instruments and operational plans. Pretests can also be used to determine the final sample size needed to make accurate inferences about the population. This is a quite a important point that we're going to investigate further in the class because the nature or the initial characteristics of the population that we learn about through a pretest sample 
can help us determine how much how many respondents we need in our full sample in order to have precise information about the pro population in our inferential statistical procedures. The pretest is also used in order to find errors. We might have errors in the wording of our questions or the way that we've ordered our questions. For example, we might find a higher level of response bias if we ask personal questions up front in our survey. So typically in survey design, we'll find that it's that we're more likely to get truth, truthful responses when we ask personal questions later on in the survey. You'll notice that asking about your about someone's income is often the very last thing that occurs in a in a short survey. We're far more likely to be successful if we start off asking questions about say gender or household size and marital status, things that aren't as sensitive. And then once we've built rapport with our respondent, we can then move on to ask more personal questions, say about social values or income levels. Finally, once we've done our pretest and we've corrected our errors, we can go out and, con and conduct our survey.